Hi, everyone. We're here for what is going to be the first episode of Ben TV, how we're going to roll out the policy planks of the, the platform that is going to inform uh, this uh, campaign for governor, how we how we see and how I see us building a, a fairer, stronger Massachusetts. Uh, before we uh, introduce uh, our first guest host uh, for this policy platform, um, uh, I want to be clear that this is going to be an ongoing process. So we'll put forward our ideas. Please share your feedback in the comments. But then moving forward, if there's something there that we're wrong on, let us know. If there's something that we could improve on, build on other states or localities that we can learn from, things you see in your day-to-day -day life, let us know. I want this to be an ongoing process. Um, and so, you know, with that, I am uh, incredibly excited to have with me um, someone who you know has meant a great deal in my life, and uh, in particular on this issue, uh, Tony Affinia, who was one of my professors at Providence College, uh, accomplished above and beyond that in his public service, um, working on some of the first uh, offshore wind projects, the, the first in the Western Hemisphere, uh, never mind uh, being a leader in his field. So, uh, Tony, thanks for taking the time to be here. I really thank you. Thank you so much for having me, Ben. I'm, I'm delighted to be here and I'm delighted to be part of this first conversation on climate change. Yeah, and we, we've come a long way for me just hanging out in the data center uh, in the summer, uh, inputting, I think, the, the populations of every county for, for Joe Camerano. I still owe him uh, one uh, there. I'm not sure if I ever got through all of the counties, but, uh, um, you know, and, and for context here, um, you know, I took politics of the environmental movement with uh, with Tony. And it was a class that, you know, changed how I thought about politics. It, it uh, you know, it means the world to me uh, to have you here because that was, uh, I hate catchphrases and everything, but that was my aha moment. That was the moment for me that said, this is the challenge of our time. And then I wanted to think about how I could use politics and public service uh, to try to try to work on that. So Thanks for well, that's here. very Thanks. gracious of you, Ben. That's what every teacher in the history of the universe likes to hear, <laughs> that their courses actually meant something. Um, like so many students who were in that class uh, before you and after you, uh, you have gone on to use the information you learned about the environment, about environmental politics. And all of us at Providence College are delighted to see you uh, during your time in the Senate and, and now in your campaign for governor. Uh, make good use of uh, what we try to do, which is to give you tools to think for yourself about some of these critical issues. So bravo to you, Ben. Appreciate that. Appreciate that. So now you get to play host. You get to quiz me, which <laughs> we're, we're back back where we started, right? Yes. Uh, just a couple of years ago. <laughs> well, a few, few hairs gone. A few hairs gone. Yeah. Well, mine are changing color. <laughs> used to be dark brown. Uh, well, Ben, I, I am curious about this. Um, there are a lot of issues in Massachusetts and any candidate for statewide office, especially uh, to be the leader of the state, has to deal with uh, innumerable uh, concerns that come from the public, that come from the legislature, uh, that come from uh, the business community. I'm curious why climate change is so important to you and why it was the is the first of these policy conversations. Why climate change, Ben? Yeah, and I think, Tony, it's because it's where it all comes together, right? You know, one of the reasons, maybe the reason that I'm running for governor um, is that I think Massachusetts has the potential to solve these big problems. What we haven't had from our leadership is a sense of urgency. And maybe on no other issue is that urgency needed than on climate, right? You know, the, the clock has been ticking and is ticking and every day we don't act with that sense of urgency, then the, the cost and the scale of what we have to do in a shortened period of time becomes that much tougher, right? So from my perspective, you know, climate for the, the, the urgency that our leadership needs to bring to it, that's why it had to be first for me. I also think because, you know, if we do this right, we have the ability to, to build a fair Massachusetts, right? To, to take on economic fairness and justice, and also to address the racial injustices that we've seen, the, the wage and wealth gaps, persistent environmental injustices in communities across the state, you know, black and brown communities burdened by fossil fuel infrastructure and pollution. So if we get this one right, this is the one where it can all come together 
and we can truly not only benefit in the short term, but in the long term. So, so for me, it is, it is the one, the issue where it all comes together, both in the short term and in the long term, and where that urgent sense of leadership has been missing. Your campaign is already striking in the sense that there are candidates for governor all across the country who never mention climate change who barely mention environmental issues at all. Certainly Republican candidates in, in many places uh, act as though the world is not changing around us. Um, not only have you addressed it, but you've developed uh, the beginnings of a comprehensive policy plan for dealing with climate change and the environment. And w there are a couple of very specific goals, which again is not common in, in uh, campaigns for governors, specific goals that you would like to achieve. The first of those is 100% clean electricity by 2030. The second is 100% clean energy by 2040. Could you talk a little bit more about those goals and how you would achieve them? Yeah, and so first, you know, I, I'm lucky in how I come to this race, Tony, and that I come having been a part of these debates in the state Senate mm -hmm. as chair of the Energy Committee for three of the five terms uh, that I was in office. So I've, I've seen the debates. I feel like I have a good understanding for where we stand. And then over the last four years, having worked at Nexam, been out there building projects, right? Building solar and battery storage projects. And I have an idea of what is out there, not only in, uh, in the market when it comes to technologies, but also what other states are doing. And we've seen you know, at least a dozen states, if not more, depending on how you measure it, up to 15 that have 100% clean electricity or clean energy goals, right? So this is not something new, right? This is not something, unfortunately, where Massachusetts is leading at this point. Um, we're playing catch up at this point, And I think it is eminently achievable. From that experience in the Senate uh, in particular, I saw that in every single debate we had around climate, we had you know, the same arguments being made that if we, we are too bold, if we go too far, too fast, too quickly, that the costs uh, will be significant and that somehow the, the benefits will not be captured. And what we saw in practice in reality was that not only did the benefits far outweigh the cost, but every single time, right? Every single time the projections undercut the, the potential uh, in Massachusetts to hit those goals ahead of schedule, under budget, and we were able to see significant growth in economic opportunity, right? You know, Massachusetts is one of mm -hmm. 41 states that has decoupled uh, economic growth from growth in emissions, right? We, we have proven you can grow your economy uh, and you can do the right thing by the environment. This is about taking that to the next level. And I think it's critically important to have specific goals in place. We know this work will be difficult. We need to have a clear sense of accountability from public leadership throughout. Um, and those goals need to match the science uh, that uh, you know, requires urgency from us. It, it's not mm -hmm. enough to say at some point in the future, we're gonna get there. We need to be held accountable every step along the way because we know time is the least renewable resource in this debate. And we need to make sure that we are not wasting any more of it. And of course, the cost of not doing anything is staggering. Uh, you, you mentioned the environmental justice communities. Of course, the cost in, in health and economic and social disruption in those communities is significant. You also have the, the North Shore and the South Shore and the Cape, uh, the, the devastation of coastal real estate, uh, which can occur as, as sea levels rise and as coastal storms get more intense. You have the, the, the uh, damage and the risk to agricultural uh, communities across the state, especially uh, in Western Mass, where um, the forests and the fields are, are, are vulnerable to drought and, and uh, increased heat. Uh, so I, I think uh, anyone watching this should be gratified that you are a candidate who is thinking not just about the cost of doing something, but also about the cost of not doing anything. Yeah, yeah there, there is... Um... You know, there is certainly the, the status quo is not sustainable and it also isn't static, right? Like it is getting worse over time. Mm -hmm. So if we don't intervene and intervene in a way that is aligned with the science, but then also intervene in a way that promotes a sustainability that is not just about environmental sustainability, but mm -hmm. is about a more comprehensive view of social and economic sustainability to make sure that the mm -hmm. Massachusetts that we aim to rebuild post COVID and that we aim to build in a clean energy and a carbon free world 
is one that ensures that everyone has the opportunity to access the benefits of that transition mm -hmm. and, and to benefit directly from it. That's critically important because if we just rebuild a clean version of where we've been for the last 50 and 60 years, that's not sustainable either. And that's not in keeping with the values that, that I, we share, the values of this campaign. And I think the values of a, a broad majority of folks across Massachusetts. Yeah. Can you say a little bit about, uh, as, as you briefly discussed, how your plans would impact the Black and Latinx and the uh, Asian Pacific American and the indigenous communities in Massachusetts? Yeah, absolutely right. So what we've seen in other states at this point, well, first, the, the general history, right? We know that for the better part of the last 100 years plus, as we have built out uh, the, the economy that we have, as we have built out the electric infrastructure, as we have built out the infrastructure that, that defines our communities, the costs of that infrastructure, whether it is roads and bridge projects, whether that's electrical infrastructure, um, all of it, right? The costs of that, both in terms of the actual building and the displacement, in terms of the uh, environmental and public health impacts have been felt most disproportionately by immigrant communities, most disproportionately by communities of color, most disproportionately by communities with the highest poverty rates. And we know there are significant ripple effects to that. We're seeing it and living it today, right? Where, you know, asthma and other uh, related diseases, right? are some of those that uh, take COVID-19 um, and literally turbocharge it and make it that mm -hmm. much worse. Never mind that those communities had the least access to testing and vaccination rollouts, right? So, you know, I think the, the most important thing is recognizing that reality and figuring out how do we build a better reality moving forward? How do we build a fairer, stronger Massachusetts that doesn't um, you know, doesn't make those mistakes again, but also seeks to, to rectify the harm that has been done? And that's mm -hmm. why in this, uh, in this policy proposal, we commit to um, ensuring 50% of the, the benefits uh, from a transition to a clean energy economy uh, are felt uh, directly in environmental justice communities, right? And that's everything from targeting our energy efficiency resources, which based on studies we've seen, uh, those resources generally go to whiter, wealthier communities. We need to be intentional about that outreach and work and also making sure that our clean energy projects are as close as possible to those communities and built in partnership with mm -hmm. those communities, right? They have had fossil fuel infrastructure foisted on them for years. They're still fighting that here in East Boston with an unsafe mm -hmm. substation that's being proposed on Chelsea Creek uh, and many others. Uh, we need to be intentional about the benefits going directly to these communities. And this isn't an abstraction for me, right, Tony? Like. I saw this growing up in Pittsfield. I know what it is to have, you know, a massive corporation, you know, bring a bunch of jobs, but also sacrifice the environment and public health and then leave a community to clean up, right? Pittsfield's still dealing with that cleanup. So I, th these issues are personal to me in that regard as well. Yeah, and I know from talking to you that you, uh, you're you concerned about all, all the people in Massachusetts, the, the wealthier coastal communities, uh, the industrial communities, uh, in central and, and uh, western mass, the, the areas of uh, where tourism and agriculture are most important, the areas where high-tech innovation are important. You're concerned about all of those areas. Could you talk just briefly about uh, how does uh, climate change uh, mitigation policy like the one you developed, how does it cross all of those ethnic and racial and class boundaries and really impact the lives of every resident of Massachusetts, wherever they may live? Yeah, to, to your point, Tony, right? It hits us absolutely everywhere. The, the regional versions of it are going to be unique, but there is no region of the state uh, that is immune uh, to climate change, right? There's no climate change vaccine. There is only the requirement for action and the call to action for all of us, right? And whether that is, you know, rising insurance rates on the Cape and the inability for folks to be able to afford to live in communities that they have called mm -hmm. home for years and being pushed out quicker and quicker, harm to the, the tourism industry that's impacted the Cape and the Berkshires, right? Been their real driver mm -hmm. as traditional industries have mm -hmm. gone away, right? Or, or just the ability to capture the economic development benefits and the significant benefits that can mean for a clean tech industry and the broader tech industry uh, in Massachusetts. I mean, the, the exciting thing for me here, right? Is not just fixing the problem, but it's the benefit that comes with fixing mm -hmm. the problem. If we get this right, 
we have the ability to capture the next generation of jobs here in Massachusetts, but we've got to be intentional about that too. Too often. Let's, let's, yeah. let's talk about that for a second, because of course, 200 odd years ago, Massachusetts was at the, at the forefront of the industrial revolution in the Western hemisphere and was a real powerhouse in industrial innovation, of course, with some help from Rhode Island, but uh, Massachusetts was right out there on, on the cutting edge. Um, 50 or 60 years ago, uh, before there was Silicon Valley, there was Route 128. Mm -hmm. uh, there was a technolo technological and, and high-tech innovation in Massachusetts. How do, you, how do you see the state of Massachusetts contributing to the global effort uh, to address climate change? What special uh, skills, what special uh, spirit does Massachusetts bring to the table? Yeah, I, I think it's it's in our DNA, right? You know, we we have you know these these incredible educational institutions from UMass to BU to Harvard to MIT, the twenty nine institutes of public higher education across the state, vocational technical schools and others like all of these partners who are ready to do this work. What it what's required is a clear commitment by uh, our our leadership, a clear commitment from the corner office that Massachusetts is going to be the nation that show, or the state that shows the rest of the nation the pathway there on 100% clean energy, and then makes a point of capturing the economic uh, benefits around it, right? It's not enough in clean energy RFPs to say, give us the least cost and we'll run with it. It's we wanna look with partners who are willing to work with us over the next 20 years, 30 years to build a pipeline of solutions because we know we will need more than just, you know, just solar, just wind, We'll need the best battery technology. We'll need the best efficiency mm -hmm. technology. We'll need the best heating technology. And we have that workforce here. We have that tech workforce. We need to invest in the Mass Clean Energy Center and then let it go out there and support the innovative jobs and workers that are out there. And then we need to try to do that work, capture that work here among the 351 cities and towns of Massachusetts because we can be a test bed for these solutions, right? We have rural uh, counties or rural communities in Western Franklin and Hampshire County. We have mm -hmm. urban communities with real environmental justice concerns. If we can solve those here, we can show the way for the rest of the nation. Quite frankly, we can steal ideas from states that are leading the way right now, whether it's our, our friends to the south in Rhode Island, our friends right over, uh, over the border in New York. That healthy competition, that's a wonderful thing. We need mm -hmm. to have more of that instead of just sitting on the sidelines in Massachusetts and saying, yeah, we'll be fine with what we get. Like we need to be intentional about this work if we wanna capture the benefit. You've, uh, uh, I wanna give you a chance uh, in the next few minutes to talk about leadership. Mm -hmm. And uh, as, as you well know, uh, achieving the kinds of goals that you've outlined in your, in your uh, climate change plan requires cooperation from the legislature. It requires um, uh, strong leadership within the administration and coordinating the various agencies, uh, uh, the departments uh, of government, as well as the uh, quasi-public agencies and regulatory bodies that are involved. It involves uh, relationships to the federal government, uh, the Department of Energy, uh, the Environmental Protection Agency, the Department of Commerce, uh, and most importantly, in some ways, it involves a relationship with the public uh, and being a leader who can, um, who can work your way uh, around opposition. Uh, these wind turbines that you see behind me are, are fan a fantastic uh, innovation and uh, really leading the way nationally for the development of offshore wind. But there was opposition, as, as you saw years ago with Cape Wind. There uh, are always people who, um, who are concerned or poorly informed or just not ready for change. You, ex you have long experience in the legislature. You have long experience commuting from the largest uh, Senate district in the state uh, to the Capitol. Uh, you've got lots of experience working with the administration, several different administrations. What, what do you bring to this job, Ben? What, what kind of leadership uh, do you feel you can offer to the legislature, uh, to the administration, and most importantly, to the public? Yeah, so I... I think, Tony, and what I'd like to think there right, is that first, right, I'm going to listen first. Uh, while, while I know I have strong ideas about where we're going to go, um, I think it's important for leaders to start by listening, because I think a lot of the, the friction and the debate that you'll come across here and in any number of other places, 
stems from people believing they weren't heard at the beginning, they weren't invited in at the beginning, right? And that's an important part of this policy process that we want to engage as many people as possible. That's why I got into the race as early as I did, right? To make the policy process part of the organizing process. But mm -hmm. I'm also someone who has seen those debates over time. And you know, we, we even saw it right when Governor Baker vetoed uh, the climate bill in January, only uh, to then finally sign it uh, a few days ago, right? Was that you know, it's the same debate that we've had for the last 20 years around costs and benefits. I know those debates, I've been in those debates. So while I'm gonna listen, I bring that sense of urgency to my leadership and the willingness to say, no, we, we've been through that debate before. I know where we land here on the data. We've had our time to listen. Now's the time uh, to move forward. And to your point, right, like that requires a series of partnerships across state government, between mm -hmm. state government and the private sector, up to the federal level and down to the local level as well to make the whole thing work. I think the most important thing that can be provided from the corner office is that clear vision, right? And to you know, the, the staff in state government at the regulatory and policy agencies, the knowledge that just go out there and follow the science, do the right thing by climate and the corner office is going to back you up. You don't have to worry about the political concerns. We'll handle that, we'll navigate that, right? And then on the local level and to others, right? Like push us, make us do better, right? We're gonna listen throughout all of this and know that you have someone again in the corner office who is trying to bring that sense of urgency. So I think it's, it's the experience, right? It's the willingness to listen. And then finally, over the last four years, right? I have come away from my time at Nexamp more optimistic and hopeful than when I showed up there, right? Having seen the, the declining costs of renewables, having seen mm -hmm. the talent in the workforce that wants to make this work and the communities that wanna make it work too. You know, it's on us as policy leaders and public leaders to make it as easy as possible to do the right thing by climate. So that's, that's what excites me about it as well. So I come to it ready to listen, with the knowledge of previous debates and, and more hopeful for what we can get done. And I think that's that's important because this is daunting work and it is easy to look at it and say, how could we ever get it done? But but the potential if we get it done is so exciting. That's that's what I want to bring to this debate as well. The, the final issue I, I, I was hoping you could address is uh, one that, as you know, is important to me, which is the role of local communities, mm -hmm. uh, the role of neighborhoods, the role of uh, small and, and medium and large municipalities. Uh, certainly, you know that the, the folks in Western Mass, uh, all the local uh, officials, county and municipal officials, are, they're not reluctant to call up their state senator mm -hmm. uh, when there are issues uh, where they believe the state can, can help of the localities. What, what do you think is the role uh, in this climate change policy? What is the role of the local, from the neighborhood level right up to uh, the county level, uh, communities and uh, officials? And what can the governor do to make sure that those local communities are fully invested and fully involved in the policy? Yeah, so I think, again, Tony, the, the role of the governor there, right, is to set the clear agenda, the clear vision, right, mm -hmm. and then empower communities, right, and, you know, whether that is silly little things, right, like, I'd love to have more competition among communities, right, like, let's set a baseline for where everyone's carbon footprint is at, and then mm -hmm. let's line up the teams that play on Thanksgiving Day in football and say, over the next three years, right, who's going to do the most to reduce their carbon footprint? And we'll put resources out at the end of it to implement it one way or the other, right? You know, I like think we need to have some fun with all of this and we need to bring that in. But again, you know, cities and towns should be empowered um, to be able to go out there and come up with their way of achieving uh, the, the goals that we all share. Because I know that answer is going to look different in Clarksburg, right? Then it's going to look in Mattapan. It's going to look different in Provincetown. Then it's going to look in Pepperell, right? And we need to have solutions that meet communities where they are and then empower local leaders to be able to use that. I also think though it is critically important that again we're listening to those communities from the start because no matter how much we say that here and now it's easy for state government to get rigid and bureaucratic and we cannot do that on this one. Mm -hmm. We need to be flexible and to your point again on trust right people trust their local leaders more. So to the extent that we can empower local leaders, we allow ourselves to go further and faster together. Well, Ben, I see we're almost out of time here. So I want to give you a chance uh, to uh, conclude this conversation today with uh, any of the concerns you have or any of the visions that you share uh, that we haven't talked about. Uh, what is it about climate change that keeps you awake at night? 
what is it about uh, the response to climate change that, that most inspires you and, and gives you the energy to continue? What is very, very hard work? And I hope everyone watching this realizes how difficult it is, how, how much energy it requires, how much sacrifice it requires to serve uh, the people of a Senate district the way you have and to serve potentially the, the entire state of Massachusetts. Uh, so what, what is the inspiration that drives you on this question of climate change that uh, gives you the energy and the, the desire to continue uh, doing that hard work and continue making those sacrifices? And kudos to your family for helping with that. We should, we should mention your family there. I, I know from experience, they're absolutely essential to, to a, a job like the one you're taking on. So tell, t say a few words before we conclude about uh, any anything that we have not discussed that you think you really want to get across to the people. Yeah, no, I think, you know, first you say family, right? You know, I mean, and family and responsibility. So I, I'm someone who grew up, you know, being told how lucky we were, reminded how lucky we were to have everything we had in life, right? Like a solidly middle-class family had all of these opportunities that our, our community had created for us. And, you know, my dad and my mom and everyone around us reminded us that we had a responsibility to give back to that community. And I can think of no other issue where that sense of responsibility weighs on me, right? You know, that, you know, I don't want to have my time finished on this planet and to look back and say, we didn't do everything in our moment to make mm -hmm. sure that future generations could, you know, enjoy the beautiful coasts of Massachusetts and Rhode Island, could, could see, you know, the, the hillsides and the farmlands of the Berkshires and, and Western and Central Mass, mm -hmm. you know, continue mm -hmm. to operate the way that they have. Like that, that, that weighs on me, it is, that's what drives me in many different things, but in particular in this issue. And then recently, right, like this month, my son Malcolm will turn four, Eamon will turn one. Um, and every once in a while when I'm not looking at them and thinking, why won't you guys just give us a little bit more sleep? The, the next thought right away after that is, you know, what am I doing to not only impart the values and, and I, me and Michaela, what are we doing to impart the values to them that we want to, but also what are we doing to make sure that the world that we leave them in East Boston, in the Berkshires and everywhere in between um, is as, you know, fair and strong and sustainable as possible. And, you know, that's what drives me more than anything else. And I think that when I drop the boys off at, at daycare and see a room full of kids who, you know, should have every opportunity that my sons have, right? So, um, that's what drives me more than anything else. And it's also what gives me reason to be hopeful, right? Because yes, these issues are difficult, um, but they are absolutely within our power, right? You know, the, the grid and the infrastructure that we have today is our own creation, right? So we can create something and imagine something and build something anew that is far better. And, and that's important for me to carry as well, because again, this stuff can weigh you down. It is daunting um, and it's serious and it's challenging but we also have reason to be hopeful and optimistic that we're gonna to rise to the occasion. Well, that's very good, a very good uh, news for the people of Massachusetts that you have that approach. And uh, it's been wonderful talking to you, Ben, and uh, I wish you the very best. And uh, I hope that uh, this, this first of your many conversations will, will uh, set things off in a right tone and that uh, the rest of your policy positions will be as clearly thought out and as 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 thoughtful uh, as this one. So thank you very much, Ben, and best of luck. Yeah, thanks so much, Tony. And, and thanks to everyone uh, for watching. I hope this gave you a good sense of what our climate agenda is going to be and, and why this is the first policy platform that we'll roll out. Um, so keep an eye out for, for future rollouts in the coming weeks uh, and months. And in the meantime, please don't hesitate to drop a comment, send a message, Sign up at benformass.com uh, to get future updates. Um, and thanks for watching the, uh, the initial episode of Ben TV. Um, I don't know if it's must-see TV. I don't know that it ever will be, uh, but it's there and we did it. Um, and I couldn't imagine anyone better to do it with than Tony Affinity. So oh, thanks so much. Thank you, thank really you so much, Ben. All right.